Good morning, everyone. I hope you are all well. Thank you again um, for coming to this very great event. And I hope you are networking and mingling nicely. Um, I would like um, to take us to the first session of the day, which will be a vision for digital and computational research in humanities and social, sci and social sciences. Prof. Fanzanen will be um, leading the session, and I'd like to call on stage um, Prof. Prof. Ralagala, who will be online, but um, there's also Dr. Franke from CPUT, Dr. Perry from Stellenbosch University, and Dr. Mukvik from UCT. I'd like to call you on stage so that we can get into the gist of things. Thank you so much. I hope we have our virtual uh, participant online as well. I'm not sure if we can see him on the screen. Uh, what I quickly wanted to, to say, so to me yesterday, um, yesterday we really looked at what is, what is digital humanities, um, or at least we tried to get a sense of what is digital humanities. I think today is more looking forward, how can we really build digital humanities um, in the country? Also in the curriculum, for example, so that's, I think, what this panel is going to be um, about as well. Um, but let me not do the talking, uh, because we have a nice panel to, uh, to have a nice discussion. I think my idea was to try and see and have a discussion, say, here on the stage, and then if there's still a bit of time to also see if we can just have a, uh, a larger discussion with all of us, I think, with the, with the topics that we, uh, we start with. Um, and, and really now I should stop talking because I want to hear what you want to, what, what you're saying. So just before we really start, um, content-wise, can you just please briefly introduce yourself? Um, so who are you, what, what's your background? And perhaps also give an example of what you think could be a benefit of um, incorporating the digital in, in the humanities uh, area, so in the humanities sphere. Um, mm. Shall we just yeah. do the round if you want to start, please? Okay. Serves me right for sitting on this end of it. <laughs> but good morning, everyone. <clears throat> My name's Errol Franke. I'm the postgraduate coordinator for the Department of IT at CPUT. I'm also an academic on our master's program where I teach um, social computing. And then on the postgrad diploma, something known as human digital interaction. And I'd like to believe that is the contribution I could potentially make here this morning in terms of how we understand the potential of digital and then where society and digital in, um, overlap that little gap for opportunity that we could use to exploit that intersection. Thank you. Thanks. So I'm uh, Doug Parry. I'm a lecturer in the Department of Information Science at Stellenbosch University. The Department of Information Science is um, part of the Arts and Social Sciences faculty there, and I also coordinate our undergrad programs, our undergrad modules, and um, conduct research that generally looks at the design, uses, and effects of modern digital technologies, things like social media, smartphones, applications, all of that kind of stuff both for individuals as well as organizations and then society at, at large. Um, I think I am gonna try to put a computational social science angle on this, on this session as we've heard a lot about digital humanities and I think there's also a space here for the computational, for the digital, uh, when we're thinking about the, about the social sciences. Um, and I'm going to also put a lens based on my undergrad teaching and uh, coordination uh, experience there. Um, hello again, um, my name is Sanyan Muftic and I work at Digital Library Services at the libraries at the University of Cape Town. Um, so my job title um, is very funny and I really disagree with it, um, but it's called Digital Scholarship Specialist um, and it's full of oxymorons um, because I think it's very hard to have scholarship that's not digital these days. So in some ways, digital scholarship is just scholarship. Um, and also a specialist within my job, it's actually been be to be more of a generalist 
to know a lot of different things about different things and be interested in different collections, so specialist also feels wrong. Um, so yeah, that's my job title, um, which I think points me, I guess, to what the digital humanities contribution is in the same way that within my team, I've got people who are engineers who are working in spatial science and they make fun of the term digital humanities all the time. Um, they say, oh look, human, uh, the people in the humanities discovered their computers and now they call themselves digital humanities. Um, am I a digital engineer now just because I use uh, tools? Um, so I think what I, I think it's about reframing it, like it's very difficult to be human these days without interacting with the digital. Um, and we can comment on it and look on it, but we also need to flip it around and look at, I guess, how can we use the technology to assess also how we're being human. Okay, it's very long-winded, but my answers will get more concrete, I promise, as we go down. Yeah. Okay, wonderful, yeah. thank you. Um, so, I, I mean, the, the background that we just heard is very, much, in a way, very much with a computational um, point of view already, right? So, can we can we be um, humanities researcher without having some some computers in it? Um, so, you might feel if you've been working in this field like that. But I know there are also um, researchers or students who are interested in humanities and they don't really have the computational experience. Uh, perhaps not yet, so we need to, perhaps we need to bring that in because it is going to be part of humanities or social sciences or... So if we now look at the curriculum, for example, uh, humanities curriculum, a social sciences curriculum, what kind of computational knowledge should we put in? So as a Perhaps as a minimum, what, what should a student, and, and because of that, and in the end, the researcher know about um, computers and the tools, and because they don't need to be a computer scientist, right? That goes too far. So what is, what is it that we need to bring in the curriculum to, to get this to work? True. You want True. to start? Yes, Prof. Thanks for that. I think um, in many ways, a department like mine, where we have explored this, this field of informatics, kind of answers your question in many ways. Because typically, IT departments would typically consist of programmers and then your comnet specialists and so forth. And then we came to understand that there's more to just those specialist streams, there's this notion of informatics, where we understand what the technologies are and how do we implement those and how do we benefit as society across different sectors within our society of that. So I suspect that in the same way humanities needs to understand this informatics concept, that there are technologies out there, and yes, I, I, you, your question earlier was, your statement, you said, can you be humanities without being digital? I suppose you could, but why would you? <laughs> you know, that would be my comeback. And I know I sound a bit of a technocrat when I say that, but the point is, I'm sure you can, you, you could possibly exercise your field without computers, so you could do it by pen and paper and literally reading books if you wish. So I guess you could, but why would you? So for the student in humanities is for them perhaps that we should be introducing the concept of informatics to them in the sense that by way of example, my two subjects that I teach in a department of IT, not in humanities, where at the master's level they get taught about social computing. In other words, all these technologies out there and how does it impact society. Similarly so at the, at the NKF level, what's it, eight level, where we teach our students that digital has moved on from the point of, you know, that typical Windows 3.1 interface that we were used to seeing, WordPerfect and all of that, to the point and click and mobile technologies now. So, even our IT students understanding that transition, I think we owe it to our fields of academia that we introduce these opportunities to our humanities students as well. So but then should we look at um, specific tools or is it the underlying? I'm, I'm looking at you, but essentially this mm. is a question for, for all of you because you have slightly different um, kind of backgrounds, slightly different points of view. Should we focus on kind of almost hardcore computer science topics that might be too much? Should we f 
focus on what you now propose, more the social computing, or should we look at specific tools? And, and, and I'm, we're kind of thinking about the curriculum, but in a way, if there are researchers here who have a background in humanities, and you're like, oh, wait a minute, this digital sounds interesting, wh where do you start? You know, mm. so it's not just within the curriculum, but also if you are an interested researcher, well, where do, where, where do you start? I think the answer is um, it depends. Uh, you know, it depends, as, as it always does. It depends, um, are you approaching this at undergrad level? Are you looking at this at kind of graduate level? Um, it'll, it'll, the answer will differ depending on, on where you're at there. I think if you're, if you're looking at how do we incorporate the digital or um, computational skills and thinking into, into undergrad programs, you probably need all of the above. Uh, not the computer science level there, but you need some understanding of this digital life, this digital society that, that we live in there, and that's sort of looking at contemporary world where we are, but also how, how did we get here. Mm -hmm. um, but then you also need some of these basic uh, computational thinking skills of um, abstraction, of um, breaking problems down, and, and so on, um, the basics of, of programming. Because I think throwing someone in the deep end and saying, look here, use tool X, tool Y, and, and go, without understanding some degree of basics is, is also dangerous. Um, and then you also need to learn some specific tools so that uh, students can, can run. I've seen if you, if you spend too much time on the abstract, you're going to lose, lose your class, you're going to lose, lose the students. And then if you spend too much time on, on application areas here and here and here, there's, there's large gaps in, in people's, uh, people's knowledge. So I think you need, you need a bit of all, all three of those. Um, and I think informatics is a, is a great umbrella term that kind of mm. captures that. Mm. Um, the, design, the uses, the effects, as mm. well as then uh, how, how do I actually think mm. about this and, and use these, these kinds of tools. Mm. I would not necessarily adopt that same approach at a PhD level or at if you're, if you're taking someone who perhaps already has experience in the field who's then looking at um, learning, learning about uh, computational tools and methods and so on. Um, you probably don't have the, the time to do a full undergrad curriculum in, mm. in this sort of area. You've kind of got to do a bit of a crash course and go from zero to 10 relatively quickly. But I think um, I would hope that people who have, are experienced researchers can pick up skills, skills quicker than undergrads could. Mm. So, so how do you do that in, say, from a library perspective? Well, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I guess I'm not a librarian, but some of my best colleagues are librarians. And I'm going to push for the library side that I think one skill it's a bit more abstract. No, it's not that abstract. Would be around cataloging or um, um, around metadata, around being able to see what you, the world around you, in a little bit like data, and being able to break that down and to find the balance between what is the strict structure of cataloging something versus a freedom to still describe it in a structured way. Um, and I think the digital gives you a lot of space to find both structure and freedom within it. And that for me feels like from a library point of view, as people work in the libraries who deal with that kind of stuff all the day, is the kind of skill that can be shared. Um, and that probably should be because I feel like a lot of the informatic and computational skills can can start once you have a sense of, okay, how can I look at this from many different sides and describe it? And that's kind of like, I think, a starting point. Mm. Um, also, the fact that the library, <laughs> the library is almost like an analog version of the internet because it's kind of like a central hub that with the people who work in the library and the connection to departments and faculties, that if you need, uh, it can be a, a, like a face-to-face -face starting point to meet people who will have and be able to help you. Mm. So I think that's kind of a lot where the library sits as a kind of, it's the place in the university that people have different feelings about it. Even within the libraries, it's like, are we books, are we data, how much are we both? But we are still like the central, we are still a thing that's gonna stay <laughs> in some ways going into the future, yeah. Mm. Mm. So, so for, for mm. me, a few things now pop up. So you look at this really from a, from a data perspective, right? So the metadata and the information that's there. Um, and, and the earlier discussion was a little bit more, at least that, that was my sense on, on the process. You know, what can we, what can we do? What, and I was kind of pushing that, of course. Um, what kind of tools do we need? Um, we kind of, kind of skipped over, but it was mentioned briefly, uh, programming. Do, do we need programming? Um, and uh, yeah, so me with a computer science background, uh, of course, I need we need programming, but um, from if you come from a humanities background, 
do you also need? I mean, how far, how how digital do we need to be? True. Um, and and that's a little bit. Yeah. On the one hand, you want to be able to handle the data, mm. but what is really needed to handle that data? Do you need? Do you need that programming? Mm -hmm. If I may, um, to go slightly back to your questions, do we teach tools or not? I have the view that um, tools come and go. <clears throat> so if we take the, the theme of transport, on a day like this, to have taught a, a student to cycle only would be a bit futile, isn't it? Looking at the weather, if we had taught the student how to drive a motor car, it would probably be more useful. They'd get there safer, drier, etc. So my point being, we go through this debate with our industry partners constantly when we have our industry advisory committees. In other words, please tell us if we are relevant to what you want from our students. And they push tools. They say, no, you need to teach our students Python. And we say, fine, we can do that, but we are not a college where you know, these private colleges that teach particular skills. We teach students how to think like programmers, developers, and so forth. So I, I, I slant towards, and while I respect the, the notion of tools, I slant towards methods and approaches, rather. So I don't disagree that we could think, uh, teach humanity students how to think like programmers, because programming thought is not about tools. My colleague here would probably, you know, the notion of identifying the problem, understanding the problem completely, being able to apply the appropriate tools, techniques, and, and thought processes in order to solve that problem. So I, I, I get you could teach programming thought or thinking to humanities students here. So it's more that computational thinking. Correct. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think I, I, I simultaneously agree and, and disagree. I, I agree that the thinking is, is, is certainly important. I, I understand the idea that a, a programming language, Python, R, you know, whatever it might be, mm. is, is a tool. But I do think that a, a programming language is a different type of tool to one particular software package or program or something like that. So a language like Python, if you know that, it's relatively easy to learn something like R or, or Java or some other, other programming language. Uh, whereas if you know tool X, tool Y might have an entirely different interface, set of operations and procedures and, and so on. So I, I understand the idea of, of not teaching tools and rather teaching thinking, but I do think that programming itself kind of em embodies mm. thinking and, and tools simultaneously, and that tool can be applied in many different ways, in many different contexts, and easily converted between language X and, and language Y. Mm. Um, so I do think finding that balance between, as you say, on the one extent, becoming a computer scientist, on the other extent, not knowing how to program, you know, where do you position yourself in that, that continuum is, is a difficult decision that will differ from university to university, from mm. program to program. Um, and I think some degree of, of exposure, both to computational thinking as well as to actual programming is, is important, um, but not, going, not becoming a computer scientist. Um, I think speaking the same language is, is important. Um, that we don't need every humanities or social science researcher to become experts in 50 different technologies and mm. so on. There's, mm. there's a you know, massive push now for team science and collaboration. And if you don't speak the same language or understand at least in some sense how these tools might work or how you might approach a problem, uh, that's, that's a problem. But if you, if you know the general gist of what's going on with something and you can collaborate as a team with two or three people who do have those skills, uh, I think that's a, also a super valuable position to be in as well. Um, I just want to, I guess, add, because um, I partly come from a drama background, and in there, they had a big thing around practice as research. That was like, that's how you get your thing, you practice as research. And for me, that felt a very, it was slightly computational approach, because for me, uh, the practice as research felt like, well, I'm trying to develop algorithms to solve this problem of getting to create something that will fulfill the PhD. So I think in terms of teaching programming, I think it's almost impossible to think as we go on and programming becomes so much around us for, for, pe for people to not be aware that the algorithms run your life <laughs> to some extent and to know how they're done. So it's not only, okay, how can I solve my problem by breaking it down into steps and following certain things and how do I repeat tasks which are, I have to keep on doing. 
Um, but to be aware of that is so crucial, even if you don't end up knowing the syntax of writing a particular language, that you understand that the world is running with algorithms all around you, and that even some of the ways that you approach your life is actually very algorithmic, you're trying to tick things off, can just unlock a lot of things around you. I mean, even, I, I was just thinking back, because I think for me, for this conference, and I don't know what today is going to be like, but the most impactful presentation was, and I'm sorry I forgot his name, um, with, a, with the notebooks. Samuel. Samuel, yeah, um, with the notebooks and that. And um, he, I don't think he's here today, but he was somehow very, felt very much against like, no, this cannot be digitized. This is me. But yet I felt looking at this process, it's very algorithmic of, of, what he's, of what he's trying to achieve and it still felt quite digital humanities even if he's like, I don't want this to go on any computer or database or anything, but his thinking felt very much like I'm doing this iter iterative process step by step to get to something. And it just felt like those notebooks were like actually almost like codes on their own of his approach. And that as an example could be a way to kind of get human, people within the humanities to see that, or to maybe fight their reluctance to step away from the digital, to see like, it's kind of already there. <laughs> it's all around you. Thanks, Dan. I, th I think what you just mentioned um, completely rings a bell for me as well. I, I, was, I was, so during the discussion, I was slightly, getting slightly afraid. So if you know how to program, then you're not so afraid of programming, right? Because you, you can do it. But if you hear people, so if you're a humanities researcher and you don't know how to program yet, then that sounds very difficult. And you see people do all these things on the computer and you don't know what they're doing. Programming, for a lot of people, looks very scary. Uh, I can completely understand that. But what you now said is essentially programming is that, that process is step by step. Uh, it's like a recipe. Mm -hmm. um, or, or the, the process, the iterative process, and if you look at it from that perspective, hopefully it doesn't it doesn't feel so 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 scary. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So I think perhaps we should focus more on that. Also, when teaching programming in that sense, so um, I, I always I always feel reluctant calling it programming, even though it is programming, because that sounds so computer sciencey and. We are not computer scientists, right, if you're a humanities researcher. Mm. Um, so should we think, and now I'm thinking of the curriculum again, but, but I think the same holds for if you're a researcher and you want to move into the digital side, should we think about it as programming or should we just see, see it as handling data or taking a process? Is it just computational thinking or is it, so, so when do we, should we just get rid of the term program? <laughs> yeah. uh, that perhaps that's yeah. what I'm proposing. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think I, I, um, the, what you said there about the, the recipes, I teach an introductory programming course to, to undergrad students. And that, this, the course con um, contains humanities students, commerce students, social science students. It's across the whole campus. Mm. And I use that exact metaphor of, of a recipe. I basically said, look, all of us have probably baked a cake or a bread, or we've made some kind of uh, meal in some way. We followed a set of instructions, uh, you know, one step after another. So in that sense, we've all programmed already beforehand. Because uh, a big thing with that is the, uh, with this course, at least with this huge range of, of people from across the campus, is the, the, the fear and the um, reluctance to, to go into, into programming. Because I think it is something that is um, it's for, for computer scientists and engineers, and, and it's not for me. Um, so you know, breaking down that fear in the beginning is, is, a, is a core part of it. And maybe, yeah, maybe as you say, um, just using a different term uh, might uh, alleviate some, some fears that people have and not framing it as this set of mathematical operations, but rather a, you're following a set of instructions. We all generally follow instructions to do something like that, one task after another or uh, you know, different tasks in different places and, uh, and so on. So perhaps a, a reframing might um, alleviate some fears. Mm. Perhaps it should be called human digital. <laughs> yeah. I saw a hand there. I don't know if we've got a roaming mic or. Sorry, I, I just heard that we, uh, with some technical issues that we've had, we now have our virtual um, a presenter online as well. And now I think I have to put the mic near the uh, earpiece and let's see if we can get this sorted. And then there will be slides shown as well. This is what you get when you have this, the, the, the technical digital side. 
Uh, sorry, is that a question? So you have a question in the room, and then I'll. for intuition and um, um, moving off, you know, the, the, the not wanting to follow to mm -hmm. the pattern, the prescription of the pattern, the freedom, the lack of freedom in, the, in that for the individual, hmm. the artist. How, how does it deal with that? Especially uh, if you're in the arts, because mm, that's what we, you know, my institute really deals with. Um, and you know, um, you know, if you're in drama, yeah. then you deal with that a lot. And yeah. also the artist of yesterday, yeah. he he was so quickly with his examples. He didn't even want to show us really properly uh, how they looked because it's also very uh, almost felt like as if it's still in the incubation stage. Mm. Um, so it's very very sensitive. I could was was my feeling about it. Mm. So. Um, yeah, it's just the, the thing of the programming of a pattern of um, prescription as opposed to something which is intuitive, True. which um, yeah. breaks yeah. the pattern. It's not prescriptive. Um, can, can you speak about that? That's, I that's feel like that's tension. directed to me. That's where much of the fear is. Yes, about, no, especially I, in the humanities. It is. I, I completely ag agree with that, and I've seen that in effect. Um, it's also interesting for me how that fear is now, how it's going to how it's going to go with artificial intelligence. So before I answer that question, it just made me think now that there is a danger that we might think with all the tools available for us that we don't actually have to think. We just know, need to know how to ask the right thing and the thing will spit it out and it will become almost transparent. And that for me is somehow kind of like it's going back to that the genius artist thing that we will just come up with this magic work of art that somehow just happened and we don't know how it got there. And yet in both cases I feel like, no, but there are steps that were taken along the way that got there that if you had taken different directions you wouldn't have gotten to the same spot. Um, I think with the creative humanists, it's, I, I think that the thing is like, you're trying to discover your own algorithm or your own pattern, so it's, it's your intuition that comes up with something. But I guess with this practices of re practice as research, it's like, okay, well, can you capture and document and put step by steps to that intuition? Which I think there is a lot of like, no, you can't, because this is just what I come up with. But yeah, yes, yes. And then, I've, then I, and that's, I think that the artists in academia always suffer in academia because they're like, why must I write about the stuff that I make? Because I just make it. It's like, <laughs> you may be. So, but I think it's interesting to discover your own patterns, your own algorithms that make you come up with things. Sorry. Okay, sorry, sorry to break up the, um, yeah. this interesting discussion. Uh, I, I, do, I do very much like, like this discussion, but we also have our virtual uh, panel member. <laughs> um, uh, here, um, Prof. Galagala from the, uh, the Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Humanities at uh, the University of the Western Cape. Now, I am going to try and see if I can get the sound to work as well. I'm supposed to try and do this. I really hope it works. I'll see. I don't know. How do I do that? Clearly, this is not my phone. <laughs> Okay, so it looks like he did drop out of that call. Um, you know, the technical issues and, yeah, 
<laughs> if only we knew more about that, yeah. right? Prof Menno, could I just perhaps pick up sure, that discussion sure. again? Um, if I understand your position, and if we subscribe to this notion of left brain and right brainers, I know that in its own presents a whole debate, and it gets better after four glasses of red wine, I know. <laughs> the point being, though, we sit with that reality in our department, where you have a field within our department known as multimedia specialists. And a lot of the multimedia specialists are, regard themselves as humanities persons. They only want to deal with a fancy interface, but they don't really necessarily want to, if they had it their way, understand what's happening behind the screen. They want to de develop beautiful interfaces for us. And so, however, when they start in the year one, they have to te um, learn programming, something known as applications development, communication, networking, all of those things. So there is a tussle, because they simply just want to get to the second and third year where they can then explore the UI bit as opposed to... So for the humanities, I understand that we, we could create conflict and tension if we decide to introduce HD as a subject, for instance, to them, where they say, no, 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 I want to dance. Don't teach me algorithms, because that then restricts the way in which you expect me to exercise my, 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 my profession. So um, I think what the message must go with if we want to introduce a subject like human digital, I'm just coining it now, I didn't give it much thought, to humanity students, is why are we doing this? The intention is the important. In other words, how do we solve this to them? That they understand that there are algorithms as opposed to this freedom that I want to exercise and express as an individual. I hope that helps. Correct. Yes. Oh, sorry, yeah. It's, 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 it's an existing tension within the arts generally, yes. this, this thing between technique and freedom and Correct. artists. But I mean, the better you, you, you actually know, you, you master your technique, actually the more freedom you have. There we go. But yeah, it's, it, it, it surfaces here again. Correct. Yeah. yeah. I 100% agree with that. I, I find programming is deeply creative. Um, but not when you don't know what to do at, at the very beginning. You know, yes. once you've <laughs> reached a certain level of mastery of your technique, it's, it's maybe as creative as any, any other creative medium um, once you've got some degree of, of skill. Mm. Thanks. I quickly wanted to, because we're also slowly getting towards the end of the time that we were uh, allocated, I quickly wanted to, to cover one topic, and that's kind of a follow-on on this. So on the one hand, we're kind of thinking about what is digital humanities, what is program, what, what do we need to learn, etc. Um, on the other hand, I work at Cellular and we're in national infrastructure. What is it that we can do or should be doing to, to boost this? Can we help with certain um, things to organize, events to organize, or um, help build a curriculum, or what, what, what is it that we can do? Um, so not necessarily for students, but on a countrywide scale. Well, it started at the right place doing roadshows such as these, I would imagine, because my understanding is you're doing it nationally, so as to get the conversation going, for instance, such as that. Um, but ultimately, uh, I serve another at the way I serve as a council member for the, for the Department of Higher Education and Training at the TVET College. So we need to get to the point beyond this conversation and debate, perhaps, into where we start influencing policy, I guess, because that's ultimately what, what needs to happen. We are in public higher education, we're not in private education, we, we're a group of CEOs of the Bostons, the whatever other institutions are, and we can go back now and implement. We need to, as a consortia, I guess, ultimately, there are good examples of consortia that have been formed in higher education and further education, where we come collectively, we debate, we discuss, we involve the relevant stakeholders, and ultimately we propose and influence policy. Because it's, it's well known that higher education is not agile enough. It takes us forever to do curricular implementation, any program changes. But the one thing we do have 
you know, in a very clandestine way, I guess, we have some influence on the content that we do teach under a particular theme of study. So perhaps there in a very kind of nefarious way, we could almost like introduce these things mm. and then obviously, but ultimately influence policy where we introduce, for instance, digital to the humanities fields. Any, any other views, ideas? I think one approach is, um, if, I, if I think of a hypothetical um, generic humanities department, which has a number of professors who've been professors for 20, 30, 40 years, who, who perhaps don't have this, this set of digital, um, digital tools, the, the question is then, uh, digital uh, skill sets, mm. the question is then, well, how, did, how, do they, how does this hypothetical department start, start teaching this, this type of, 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 of um, skills and, and knowledge and so on to their, to their students? Do they, do they find some other department in their university to, to teach that? But then it's going to be information systems or, or computer science, and it's not going to be for the humanities specifically. It's not going to be people who understand the same questions and problems that might actually be applicable to that uh, that particular department or area of, of the social sciences and humanities, do they, um, as people with 30, 40, 50 years experience, um, try uh, become coal miners who learn how to, how to code at, at that point? Um, that, that may be, may be challenging. Um, do you bring in uh, newer people who might have those skills? I think it's, it's open questions. And I think mm. something that, that Sadilar uh, could, could look into is the kind of idea of train the trainers, so to speak, of um, short courses, whatever you want to call them, workshops, things like that for equipping uh, postgraduate students, PhD students, postdocs, or um, st uh, academic staff members with these kinds of, kinds of skills. Um, and we tried something like that a couple of years ago at, at Stellenbosch. We partnered with some researchers at Duke and Princeton who run what's called the Summer Institute in Computational Social Science. And there, the general idea is to train junior staff members and senior postgrads in uh, who are social scientists but don't have computational skills in programming, data analysis, data cleaning, data wrangling, all of that kind of stuff in a, in a two-week uh, hands-on uh, summer school. Um, and that was started by, by two guys at, at Duke and Princeton, and they've since expanded now to, to run, I think there's about 30 of them around the world. So, so we ran it for two years. Uh, I think at UJ, they've now been running it for the last two or three years. And the idea there is that these uh, students or junior staff members go back to their departments with these skills, and maybe the next year they run their own summer school or their own their own short course, and obviously use these skills in their, their own research projects, and, and perhaps uh, that filters into their, into their, um, their teaching. Because um, I've seen, I know Bronwyn did a project here um, where a computer scientist teaching uh, social scientists how to, how to code, um, there's, there's different ways of thinking, and it often leads to a bit of a, a clash and, and misunderstandings. Um, so I think it is important that um, it's not necessarily done by outsiders to the humanities and to the social scientists. You need social scientists and humanities experts who also know how to code to be teaching this um, for it to actually be successful. Yeah, thanks. Perhaps some, some final words? Um, sure. We've, we've had uh, the whole row again. <laughs> yeah. um, no, I, I think what, um, what both of you have said I would completely agree on. Um, it's also, I find in my line of work, I, I sometimes encounter how much supervisors can be a barrier to postgrads trying out computational aspects in their humanities research. And I don't know how, it's, it's a pity because if the supervisor doesn't allow for that space, that postgrad student might never embrace it as much and when they become professors, they will also cap it at some point. Um, so I don't know how Sadilar could go and <laughs> um, work with the supervisors. But I think what I, what I quite um, think is useful because there's so many pockets of people doing like even this conference and that's why it's a great thing to see all the pockets of DH projects happening and having that, um, the map, the escalator, is it the escalator? I forget the terminology for it, where you can see the map of uh, what everybody's doing. Um, I feel like I can use it as a resource if somebody's like, well, I'm interested in this computational thing, my supervisor's not really keen on it. Then it could be like, well, have a look there and see if there's somebody who's working on something similar that might provide you some support. Um, because it's not possible <laughs> to be a digital humanities expert because it's such a wide field, so you won't be able to solve all the problems, but chances are in the country somebody will. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. I, I, really, I really like the link to the stakeholder map again. Uh, that, that was what it was called. <laughs> uh, no, but thank you. Thank you all very much for, for this panel. We need to wrap up. Um, I think, Masi, you want to 
take over. So yeah, I, I got some information in my ear. Uh, I didn't fully get that. But I would very much like to thank you for this uh, interesting panel. And I think um, there's enough uh, material for, for further discussion as well. So during mm. the breaks, please, um, please have the discussion. But thank you very much for this, uh, for this panel. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you, and I think we can have lots and lots of discussions with our panelists later on. But now I would like um, to welcome Prof. Ralagala. He is online. Okay. Can we also have his slides up, please? Thank you so much, Prof, for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Am I audible? Yes, yes, Prof. Okay. So, shall I, shall I proceed? Yes, Prof, you can proceed. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I have put together a few slides. Um, I'm not so sure whether you are able to present it from your end or do I try? I mean, I've been struggling with technology this side. My connectivity is, is sort of messing up. So, but I did, I did send through my slides. We can see your slides now, Prof. We have them. You can talk over them now. Okay, that's fine. Thank you so much. I'm not going to say um, much, actually. I responded to the brief uh, that uh, I have to reflect on one or two of the projects that we're busy with in, within the faculty, but also, um, you know, highlight uh, some future projects which relate to digital humanities within the faculty. So that's what I'm going to do. And I can manage this within the next five to six minutes and then possible have a discussion if you allow it. So um, we can go to slide number one. Um, the next slide. Thanks. Um, colleagues within the faculty are, you know, leading in various projects uh, that are linked to digital humanities in some way. So I can mention one or two, if not three, for example, um, some some few years back, uh, we we had, for example, the Department of Linguistics under the leadership of Professor Basi Antia, uh, who sort of decided to introduce um, his students uh, to the whole notion of podcasts um, at undergraduate level, and this was mainly. Uh, meant, you know, to capacitate uh, undergraduate students uh, with a view to produce podcasts in Isikosa and Afrikaans um, in terms of English lectures at third year level. And these were based on multilingualism courses within the Department of Linguistics. So that's one interesting, uh, you know, uh, development that I would want to share. Uh, the next one uh, was very much linked to postgraduate students, uh, web localization, that was it. And this was meant to enhance the quality of information uh, retrieved from Isikosa web. And, and I think that project has its successes uh, as it was directed by someone who had you know, the whole knowledge about it. We do have current projects, um, although they are sitting in pigeonholes. I'm saying in pigeonholes in the sense that colleagues tend to work in their corners without uh, willing to share some of some of these projects. Yet there's so much um, in common if you take a closer look at what they are doing, and that takes away the whole notion of enhancing and integrating and work well with, with you know, um, high degree of effectiveness, if, if you understand what I'm trying to say. 
One example here is the current project, which is uh, multilingualism assessment. And again, this is educational, uh, meant to create learning nuggets with students. Um, a project uh, on multilingual assessment, which is funded by the Ministry of Science, Research and Culture uh, from Germany. And again, we have the, de the Department of Linguistic Leading in that um, under the leadership of uh, Basiantia. Um, there would be other, I mean, this list is not exhaustive. You do have other projects from the centers which are similar in nature, um, which have not been captured here, but I, I had to pick up on those which were readily available at the time. We also have the Bakbonda project, which I think colleagues uh, who are participating in this workshop have knowledge about, that is the boosting the use of African languages in education, uh, which in essence uh, is a range of digital resources uh, being developed to support the learning of African languages. I mean, there are all sorts of related projects along this one. So it is uh, a UWC project working hand in hand with other universities, colleagues from other universities that I know do participate in this. I don't have to say much about it. We also have uh, future projects, I think. And I can also point out that in terms of our vision for the future, I think the idea is to see to the consolidation and institutionalization of some of these projects because um, it, it's kind of counterproductive where you have projects which are somewhat similar but not integrated. So we would want to at least reach out to colleagues where they see you know, parallels in projects such as educational projects uh, that they can at least forge collaborative relationships um, which will enhance and, and, and allow them to work better and, and reach you know, their goals in terms of the, the, the various projects. Um, the other one would uh, relate to the UWC language policy implementation and multilingualism. Chair, you might want to go to the next slide. Sorry, I'm, I'm ahead of you now. Yes, uh, bullet number two the UWC language policy implementation and multilingualism. We are lagging behind as the institution in terms of this particular project. I'm sure colleagues, uh, colleagues from COPAL will, uh, will give testimony to this, but we are hard at work uh, trying to rejuvenate and resuscitate our language policy, which will then um, reinforce um, related projects such as multilingual glossaries. I do know that some of the institutions are, are well underway um, in terms of uh, putting materials together um, in this particular project. But I think we have a long way to go as an institution because it has to be driven by our language policy and other you know, uh, support system that we have to put in place. We have to put. Then in, in that case, the, the digital humanities project would, would come quite handy in terms of embedding it in some of the related projects that will come out of our implementation of the language policy. Um, again, we, we are also very much involved in the forensic linguistic um, uh, project, which is a fairly new discipline in, in South Africa, in Southern Africa. Uh, the plan about this, uh, apart from everything that we have achieved so far, is to establish a global center in forensic linguistics. Um, uh, coupled with that, uh, we are already, you know, uh, pushing the agenda in terms of our postgraduate supervision. Uh, we've managed to recruit quite a number of students who are working in this field um, and the areas that would attract you know digital humanities um, have been outlined here in this 
presentation, such as I can mention, uh, for example, sign language interpreting and legal interpreting. As a matter of fact, we are in discussion with the Department of um, Justice and Constitutional Development. Um, and they have a lot of interest to work with us in putting together a program that would focus on legal interpreting, taking to account, you know, the digital space, because this is what we think is lacking in terms of, um, you know, uh, taking the education, I mean, the academic project forward. So that that is happening. And of course, you are looking at authorship attribution which is another interesting development linked to forensic linguistics. And uh, that again would be made possible uh, at a high level uh, through the introduction of the state of the art uh, machinery technology, uh, which will come quite handy once we have the center up and running. Um, police interviewing record construction and sound statements it's another area that we've made, you know, headways in, and uh, we do have students that are interested in this um, at PhD level. And again, um, there is a need, you know, to in terms of reforms, to sort of introduce a complete, um, you know, and holistic model for police record construction. We know where the problem is with our police uh, service and the extent to which this affect uh, negatively you know, access to justice. So we, we would want to have those relevant technologies through digital humanities uh, to sort of come into place and, and, and work hand in hand with government to, to, to support them to, to a level where we would be able uh, you know, to make a contribution and uh, change people's lives. Some of these things, if you care to know, they tend to affect or, um, you know, people who are poor and the people who are on the receiving end, if I go back to the notion of language policy, are those people whose language um, is not the language of record. So if you go to the next slide, you might want to um, click on that uh, uh, little thing there, which should give you a sense, yes, yeah, the play button. And I can, I can just talk to that for a second after you've, you've managed to, to play it. Is it responding? Looks like it's not responding, Prof. It's not responding. Um, I can share, maybe let me try and share my screen uh, from this side. You can stop from your side. Okay. You can share, Prof. Okay. Right. Are you able to view from your side? Yes, Prof. All right. Um, I'm, I'm now playing it. It's responding and you can watch it for a second. And as you watch it, think about what you see This is our police setup as we know it. Now this person is embroiled in a criminal activity. Violated and uh, she's now presenting the statement to a police officer. 
and you can also pick up the dis disruptions by a second police officer. Look at the documents, the matter goes to court. And this would be the outcome which is not desirable because our system has some flaws. Now, if we were to introduce um, the Digital Humanities Project in such spaces, this is likely to work in this way. That's it. Colleagues, I would want to pause and allow questions, if any. That's that's my story in brief. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Thank you, Prof, for that very informative presentation. Do we have any questions for Prof? But I think we can also add some questions for the panelists as well. We can take just a few. Any questions? Any comments? Any feelings about what was discussed? We've got two hands. Okay. I have a comment. There's more something that uh, I saw on the slides. You, you spoke about. Um, attribution and authorship and I think not specifically a question for you but it's something that we all probably need to think about as um, software development and software and digital becomes more embedded in how we do things that the ways in which people contribute to that is going to be an important change for attribution and, and authorship uh, an example I was working on a, a piece of software the research team recently and uh, we published a paper for the software but then a year later three new people enter the team to keep developing the the tool they're not authors on the original paper, but we need to attribute their their works. As as our method, you know, how do you do you attribute uh, where the data comes from? Are, are people involved in data collection and data uh, curation? Is that authorship? Um, you know, things like that are open questions that digital humanities scholars will need to to um, to embrace and and, and discuss and. And think about how that what that implies for us. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for that. Would you like to respond to all the questions, Prof, or one each? Well, I, I, I'm sure it's a discussion. I mean, it, it, it this is open for discussion. But I would want to, um, you know, concur with colleague, um, you know, from the floor that these are new developments in the humanities. I mean, attitude, attribution and authorship identification is, is a new area within forensic linguistics. It, it's quite big um, in the UK, in Australia, um, in the US, but not in South Africa. Um, what I find interestingly is that it's, it's sort of gaining momentum. Momentum. As a result, we, we have a student who's due to submit a thesis on authorship attribution next week by the name of Zan Kotze. And she has done excellent work. And I guess um, taking this forward, um, I think uh, we will need some kind of support in terms of digital humanities for such rising stars as they uh, you know, explore, uh, you know, further studies in terms of authorship attribution. So we, 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 we have to leverage on, on, on these technologies. Obviously, I, I fully agree. And I think embedding and integrating, you know, them into our research agenda is, is one of the important ways that we would want to consider. Thank you. Hi, um, I just wanted to come back to the discussion that we had earlier about um, teaching and the role, you know, how we incorporate some of these new techniques in teaching. And I wonder if we've thought a bit about um, looking at our students, undergraduates and postgraduates as valuable resources in this space, 
because so many of them come with more knowledge than we already have around you know how to uh, interact with the digital world all those kinds of things and how can we think about you know involving them in this process of digitizing things and really um, the co-creation of not only the knowledge but of the techniques that we need well if i may uh chair may i yes 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 prof yes um i, I just want to make a, a very interesting example um i do understand that uh you have people like professor langa kumalo as as part of you know this this project um he comes from a university um, in KZN where you have Isi Zulu, um, you know, as one of the important languages, uh, I mean, highly embraced by or through the academic project. And uh, my sense is that um, if you are in language practice and you are a student in that university, you do have to take Isi Zulu as one of the subjects or modules, if you like. Um, my sense is we may have to do the same in terms of digital humanities, that it becomes one of the compulsory um, modules for all the students in the arts and humanities or social sciences. And that would be one way of reinforcing you know, not only the use of technology, but also the application. So that by the time students get to higher levels, they have a better sense of this particular, you know, specialized knowledge, and they know its importance, its value and its application as they, you know, make their choices going forward in terms of postgraduate studies. Um, through that, we might be able to win. This goes, you know, um, sim I mean, if you want to promote uh, research as some of these, uh, you know, institutions of higher learning are aspiring, um, you know, in terms of becoming research led universities. But I mean, you, you can't begin to talk about this uh, meaningfully if you don't uh sensitize and push the research agenda at undergraduate level it has to start there it cannot be um that you will you know make a miracle if it's it's, it's a project that you know gets introduced at owners level so we need to find ways and means and we need to think you know innovatively and see to it that it starts at a lower level so that would be my take Thank you so much, Prof. Thank you for all the questions.